Turned over to the other campus this morning. I had Tim sweating out, preaching, printing all sermon outlines back there. But praise the Lord, amen. I got a stir stick and everything. It's what the music team does. They throw the trash down behind the plants. Amen. Ah, take a big breath. Praise the Lord. Settle in. We're here. Amen. It's good to see you this morning. Y'all turn to the person beside you and say, I'm glad to be in church. I'm glad to be in church too. We're in a series of messages. If you're visiting with us today, it's the last in a series of uh, four sermons called From Coward to Courageous. And it's uh, a real close look at the life of Gideon and the battle with the Midianites. Israel had known peace for many years, and seven years now of trouble have come into the land because the people had rebelled against God. It usually happens when we rebel against God. Trouble is just an invitation to trouble. So the children of Israel have uh, been hiding in caves and running for fear and living in fear and dispersed throughout the place. God's looking for someone as in all situations that, he'll, that he can use in a situation. And much of this whole story of Gideon, as you look through it and you study it, and as we've looked at these last several weeks, more than building an army, more than preparing the nation of Israel, God has been working in this one man's life. He wants to do something with him. And this whole story of Gideon is a case study, really, of the grace of God and the mercy of God as he deals with us, speaks to us, draws us, ministers to us. So often we, we step back and don't really understand the dealings of God in our life and how God speaks to us and how he ministers to us. And we miss so much. Even Gideon, when the angel of the Lord begins to speak to his heart, and you know, says, Thou mighty man of valor, I don't think he got it. He immediately begins to fall into what I call the victim mode. You know, well, if, where is God? If God's for us, why is all this happening? He says, I heard about his miracles. I don't see any miracles. And all the time, you know, the, the angel of the Lord has just said, you're the, you're the man. You're the man I'm going to use. And he goes through this process where it's almost as though the angel ignores his excuses and this self-victimization that he goes through because it wasn't valid anyway and if he set down Gideon he probably knew it wasn't valid but it, isn't it always easier to blame somebody than to deal with our own issue isn't it easier to blame our parents or our environment or whatever it might be the government our boss you know our spouse and get real honest with ourselves and take a real close view and be transparent with what God's trying to say to us and what God's trying to do to us. It's much more constructive than what most people realize. So as he goes through this process, remember the next thing he does is he offers an offering to this, this messenger of the Lord, and the offering is received, and Gideon still doesn't quite get to, oh, I'm going to die now. I've seen the angel of the Lord. And, you know, the angel's trying to chill out. You're not going to die. You know, he said, you're not going to die, Gideon. So he goes through that deal, and, and then uh, he gets to the process of... Uh, raising the army. They sound the horn, and 32,000 men appear to, the, to, the, to Gideon to deal with, and the Lord says, you know, this is, this is uh, too many people here. Remember, the Midianites are in 130, 150,000 with camels, strong. They come in like a, a plague of locusts, and like a cloud they come in and consume. And the Lord says, you know, if I save you from the Midianites with these men, then you're going to get to thinking, hey, look what I did. This is the Joe Arms translation. God won't be glorified. I want to get this to a situation where you'll be victorious, but I'll get the glory. And how often do we fight that in our life? Because we just feel like, you know, the more I can do myself and have control of myself and get myself, you know, and it usually just leads to pride and arrogance anyway. As we broke the message down from there in the last couple of weeks, we, we broke down last week to the Midianites, the, the dispute, uh, the mission we talked about, the, the 300 ultimately against, you know, the 132,000. And we dealt with how he, he de de brought down those men to 300. And uh, we're not going to go into that today, but there's a message available on CD or DVD if you want it. But today I want to look at the Midianite and the dream that the Midianite soldier had and the interpretation of a dream, as well as I want to look at the means, which get in when he gets his 300 together after that, that hearing that dream, he talks about, he gives them what they're going to need to fight the battle with and the devices that are given to each man. And the third I'm going to look at today is the method, <clears throat> the direction that he gives them so that they can experience the victory in life. And these, these are so applicable to our lives today and how God deals with us in reducing us as individuals to get us to the point where we'll really just rely on the Lord, not on our, 
our abilities, our strength, our ingenuity, but we'll really trust the Lord. That, that is such a hard place for, for us to come to. I, I didn't even want to come to that place when I gave my life to the Lord. I, I had this mindset, well, you know, I, I can't do that. It won't work for me. I'm not going to pretend. I'm, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. On and on it goes on. But what I was saying was, you know, I am myself not strong enough. But then when I get out there after I've given my life to the Lord, I think I am strong enough. And God has to reduce me again to show me, no, you need me. <laughs> you need me all the time to trust me. So as we get into this, we see that this is where Gideon still is. And again, as I have said, this is, this is a, a great characterization how God deals with an individual and mercy, you know, and grace. You know, if I'm the angel of the Lord, even in my first dealings with Gideon, I go and announce, and God says, all right, you're the angel, you know, and I go off and I tell, you're this mighty man of valor, and then I see how he responds and slap him upside the head. You know, no, he's just gracious with him and gentle with him. And, 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 and church, you're glad the Lord deals with you that way. <laughs> we, we probably deserve a slap up against the head occasionally. But he, he's, he just keeps guiding this guy. And he gets down to this point of the story when he starts talking about this, this Midianite dream and it's the Lord encouraging him. And verse 9 says something like that, that same night how the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp I've given in your hands. In verse 10 he said, If you're afraid, take your servant pure with you. And they get down to the camp and verse 13 will pick up there. When Gideon came, behold, there was a man relating a dream to his friend. And he said, Behold, I had a dream. A loaf of barley bread was tumbling into the camp of Midian and it came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and it turned upside down so the tent lay flat. And his friend said, this is nothing less than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, the man of Israel. God has given Midian and all the camp into his hands. Now, here, we're, these are the Midianites talking amongst themselves. They're 132,000 strong. You would think that you know, there'd be a little different talk going on down there. But apparently they've had spies in the land as they were known to do. And then you always had the cowardly group that would go up and tell what was going on. And so they're sitting there and God says, all right, I want, if you're still afraid. And he's honest enough to realize, hey, man, I've still got some, some doubts about this, all right? And he goes down with his servant and they hide out behind the bushes. And these two guys are talking. I had a dream, man. You wouldn't believe this crazy dream. And dreams are crazy, aren't they? Yeah, I had this crazy dream. And man, <clears throat> this, this, this giant loaf of bread came tumbling down the mountain, big loaf of barley bread, hit one of the tents, laid it flat, flipped it over and laid it flat again. Just amazing. What? Yeah, you had too much pizza last night or what? <laughs> you had tacos for dinner? See, I'll tell you what that means. And all of a sudden, out of the voice of the pagan mouth comes an interpretation from the voice of God that confirms to Gideon that he's been called by God. That God is on him, God is going to use him, God is going to do this for him. And he speaks from the dream. All oh, that barley loaf represents the children of Israel and Gideon more specifically. And by the way, a barley loaf, that was the cheapest loaf of bread you could buy. It was the bread of the poor, they called it, all right? And he said that, that represents Israel. And that he's going to come down as like one man and he's going to lay us flat. We're, we're doomed. Now, isn't it good to know that the enemy knows they're defeated? Isn't it good to know the devil knows he's defeated? He just is doing everything he can to convince you that he's not. And by the way, anything he tells you, Scripture prefaces it like this. For he is the father of lies. So Satan's M.O., his method of operation has never changed. He's still the father of lies. Everything he tells you is a lie. Anything he tells you, believe the opposite. Pretty simple way to handle him. And so he gets to this dream and catch what happens here. In Judges 7, 15, it says this. And it came about when Gideon heard the account of the dream and its interpretation that he bowed down to worship and he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the camp of Midian into your hands. What I want you to know is one verse, you have two actions. Worship, action, work. Worship followed by deeds. Worship followed by commitment. Worship followed by movement. If when we come to worship and it doesn't do something in us which propels us to action, then we really haven't worshiped. I believe all my heart when I truly have an encounter of worship, that I'm meeting with God, God's speaking in my heart, my heart is laid bare, He can deal with my life, I'm hearing what He has to say, that always promotes and propels me to action and activity in my life. 
If all we do, even on Sundays, is just come and hear sermonization, words, evangelical verbiage, then we have literally wasted our time and wasted God's time. We said we came to worship. If all we're doing is singing the songs, letting the word come in and come out, vocalizing the chords and notes and words, then, then we've missed it. We ought to realize that we are coming to encounter the living God. We're coming to meet with God. I'm here today to hear from God. When I have my own quiet time, that's what you want to go, a devotion. When I spend time in the Word of God or with prayer, there should be an encounter. I should realize this is a moment for an encounter. I'm having a, I'm, I'm in a confrontation with God now. And when that happens, if I am listening and receiving, then something is happening in me which is moving me forward and moving me outward. And if I miss that, I really can't say that I've really worshiped God. Scripture says you can worship in vain. Jesus put it this way. Why do you worship me with your lips, but your heart is far from me? Why are we willing to say amen to the sermon? Sing the song, but not let God do something within us. Don't you just love this verse? I mean, and they're right there in the same verse. Gideon heard the account, interpretation. He bowed down in worship. And then he got up and went back to business. Man, if anything worship does, it ought to get us back to business. Amen. So it's an important part of what's happening here. One, it shows how that God is still dealing with Gideon. And there will not be a time where God doesn't deal with Gideon. This is our last sermon we're sharing in this series. But if you read the whole account through, unfortunately, it doesn't have a happy ending. Gideon stops listening. Gideon stops worshiping. Gideon stops spending time with God. And he does some stupid stuff, which end up in his destruction. It doesn't have to be that way. The course and the recourse for success is to stay the course. Stay on track. Listen to what God is saying. Continue to worship God. God will walk you through this. So he, he hears from God. He hears this interpretation. And he moves forward at that point, And he comes and he gathers the men together at, at the camp. And he equips them. And I'm going to say with four. There's three things literally in hand. But one thing is in, in, in word. It says he divided the 300 men in, in, into companies. And when he gets them into their companies, he puts trumpets and empty pitchers into the hands of all of them with torches inside the pitchers. Verse 17, he said, look and do likewise. Behold, when I'm come to the outskirts of the camp, do what I do. The first thing he gives them is trumpets. Trumpets are handed out. Now, remember we talked about last week this, the, the trumpet sounding. This is not a musical trumpet, you know, nice, metallic, whatever materials is made with it. It's going to put forth pleasant notes and sounds. It's not a musical instrument trumpet. This is a loud, glaring, obnoxious sounding trumpet just to hear it. If you've ever heard anybody blow a shofar horn, it's not pretty. All right? Just, it's not something to say, hey, I think I'll sit down and listen to a CD of shofar. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. It's not going to make the top ten list. But it was an important part of the, of the history of Israel as well as the church. The Old Testament and the New Testament mention this horn and what the horn does and the importance of a horn and what it's all about. First of all, you see the trumpet in the Old Testament would summon the nation, you know, come together. I, I believe that we need to hear a trumpet in the church today that calls us together, that summons us. You know, there's something about just going to a meeting and there's something about realizing I'm called to a meeting. This, this, that when Sunday morning comes, there's something in my spirit that's calling me, that's drawing me. It's not just habit. It's a good habit, but it needs to go beyond the habitual to the spiritual. Well, I realize I'm part of the kingdom of God. I'm part of the body of Christ. There's structure. There's order. There's, there's a commitment involved. There's, there's disciplines and discipleship involved. I, I'm going to be a part of the body of Christ. So there's this summoning. But not only is it sent to summon, it was a, to, to call public attention. Pay attention. Listen. All right, listen. And so as a sounding trumpet would be sounded, something's getting ready to happen. Pay attention. It was out of the ordinary. It wasn't a norm of song and music. It was just this loud sound that would, that would come out. So pay attention to what's going on. The third part of it was to, to recognize the, the ascension of the king, of a king. 
Or you can be sure the Bible tells us in the New Testament there's going to be another trumpet that sounds and we're going to see the descension and the ascension. The king's going to descend in glory and he's going to ascend to the throne of David in Jerusalem. And it's going to be a glorious trumpet sound that we see that. But not only is it the, to recognize the ascension of a king, it was always used as a call to, to arms, a call to battle that there's a war happening, that we need to get to the front line, that we, it, whenever there would be a trumpet sounded, that, that meant you need to go to that place and pay attention right there because that's where the battle is. Beautifully in line with this was, it was also a sound that would be given a victory, that there would be this great call to victory and the people would rejoice. As well as there's a battle cry, there's a victory cry. But not only that, it was in recognition of the day of the Lord in the New Testament. As I said, there'll be this great ascension of the king. Now, every one of these, uh, you can apply in a very clear spiritual truth to the church today, that we need to hear a trumpet sound. We need to hear the shofar sound. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. The second thing they were given was empty pictures, all right? Now, these pictures represent, for us in the New Testament context, our bodies, our lives. Romans 12, 1 talks about that we are the, the temple of the living God. It says, so we present our bodies as a living sacrifice. The Bible says in Romans that the body is for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. The Bible tells us that Christ is in us and that is the hope of glory. So these vessels represent in the New Testament context, you know, that which holds the light. It represented very clearly, not just represented, it was the vessel, a clay vessel that held light. We were formed from the clay, from the dust of the earth. Once we come to God and surrendered hearts and surrendered lives, it placed in us is this light, this light of God's grace and this light of God's glory. The Bible says it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. So God places his light and his life in us. And how does he do that? He literally comes on board. He comes in to abide in us. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Now, as he comes and we surrender our heart and we're saved, Jesus regenerates us, what happens is he occupies these vessels. In other words, this is the means now. If my body's the temple of the Holy Spirit, if Christ is in me the hope of glory, then now my body becomes the means by which people cannot come, come to know about God and come to hear about God and come to see God because he's literally in this vessel. Now, We'll see as the story goes that a vessel for the light to shine had to be broken. And there's a lot of folks in churches today who are not broken. And as a result, there's no light shining through their life. Light is in us. We've given our life to Christ. Light is in us. You know, we have the very light of the world, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. But unfortunately, that light can only show and can only shine through a broken life and a yielded life. We'll come back to that in a moment as well. The fourth thing they are given is a confession. It's a testimony. It's a word, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. You say, well, that doesn't sound like much. This is, this is, this is an important lesson here because everything they get in their hands for battle is not what you think. Let me give you a shield. Let me give you a helmet. Let me give you a sword. No, you don't get any of that. Excuse me, I need a sword. No, you don't get a sword. Where's my sword? I'm gonna give you another sword. A sword that's sharper than any two-edged sword. I'm gonna give you a sword that's greater and more powerful and, and, and more penetrating than any physical sword you could ever hold in your hand. In fact, I just want you to say it. The sword of the Lord. Now, we know in scripture, when we start studying what the sword of the Lord is in Ephesians 6, it even tells us as part of our spiritual armor and our spiritual warfare that the offensive weapon that God places in our hand, the only offensive weapon is the sword of the spirit. And what is that? Which is the, which is what? In other words, if I have the word of God, I have a sword. I have a sword. If I have the word of God, I have a sword. Hebrews tells us that not only is it just a sword, it, this word of God is a living sword. It's an active sword. It's a sharp sword, sharper than any two-edged sword. And it does what? It will pierce, not just the flesh. It goes beyond that into the soul, into the spirit, into the joints, into the marrow. And it's even able to discern and to judge the thoughts and the intents of a person's heart. In other words, when the word of God comes, it penetrates me. 
It goes deep into my very core of my being and it begins to sort things out. It begins to show what is real. It begins to light up the areas of my life that need to be lit up, dispels the darkness and brings that great grace of God and conviction where the Holy Spirit begins to take that word and my mind begins to turn, my heart begins to yield and God is dealing with me and revealing himself to me. And it's a beautiful, glorious picture of the word of God. The Bible says on that great day, when the enemies of God are gathered in the valley of Megiddo by the hundreds of thousands and they think they're going to somehow stand against God and all the demons of eternity past and present are there energizing all those people at Megiddo. The Bible says that we will come with the Lord and he will be riding on a white horse and out of his mouth as he enters the atmosphere of this world and reveals himself in power and glory, out of his mouth will come a two-edged sword which will destroy the enemy. Same thing as with Gideon's day. They're going to fall on each other in that moment at that valley of Megiddo, take their guns, their knives, their and they will begin to destroy each other. Their blood will flow till it reaches the horse's reign. That's a moment of glory and power. You know, if you want to see the word of God, just look there, what, that word's powerful. The Lord just opens his mouth and speaks a word. What word? I don't know, drop dead perhaps. I don't know, confusion. But whatever that word is, the enemy begins to internally assault themselves and destroy each other. So here they have, what we have, we have a trumpet in the right hand. We have a pitcher with light, two and three, in our left hand, and we have a sword in our mouth. And so Gideon gets them together. And he said there in that one verse, in verse 17, you know, here's, here's what I want you to do. And he gives the method after this instruction. Verse 17 starts out, do as I do. When he gets down here into verse, where are we at? 19. Gideon and a hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. And when they had posted the watch and they blew the trumpets, smashed the pitchers that were in their hands. When three companies blew the trumpets and broke pitchers, they held the torches in their left hand and the trumpets in their right hand for blowing a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Each stood in his place round about the camp and all the army below ran crying out as they fled. And when they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord set the sword of one against another, even throughout the whole army. Now, when you get back to verse 17, when he comes back, he said, here's how we're going to do it. First of all, look at me. No, you can look at me, but that's what he said. <laughs> look at me. Look at me. When I and all who are with me, no, you, you look at me, follow the leader, is what he's saying. Look at me. Pay attention. Scripture tells us, you know, that we're looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The most important thing we do on a daily basis as Christians, if we want a real clear, victorious walk with Christ, is we have to keep our focus on the leader. We have to constantly be looking to Christ because when we look away, when we look away, all of a sudden we get easily distracted as Peter on the waves or any other Christian in this world in the, in the turmoils of their life. When you quit focusing on Jesus, right there, boom, trouble begins. The problem starts. You start looking at some desire. You start looking at some sin. You start looking at some temptation. And all of a sudden you begin to be consumed. But he said, we look unto Jesus. He says, you look at me, you do what I do. In other words, Christ has come. Yes, he is the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. Yes, he is the Lord of glory. Yes, he's the risen King of kings. But he is also our, our, our leader, our example, the direction in which we go. And we're living in a culture today in America, especially that's lost the mindset, lost the attitude, you know, of, of leadership and following. It's, it's kind of every man for himself anymore. Don't tell me what to do. The average attitude among them, the, the, the normal American citizen kind of is, is displayed in that mindset. Nobody can tell me what I can do and nobody can tell me what I can do. I'm a free American. But let me tell you, you're listening to one or two voices and they're telling you every day what to do and you're doing it. You're listening to the Lord or you're listening to the liar. I prefer the leadership of the Lord. But isn't, isn't it true that the whole context of discipleship has been lost in the modern church today? The people, we don't, we don't have, I'm a church member, but I, I'm not a, and I'm a good Christian, but a disciple? Disciple has to do with discipline. 
The disciple has to do with listening. The disciple has to do with hearing and watching and learning and duplicating, imitating, following. That's what discipleship is. It means that I'm looking to the leader and I'm following the leader and I'm responding to the leader and I'm hearing what the leader says. It's amazing. We just don't get that anymore. And at the same time, it's always amazing how many movies introduce that concept, you know, into some movie and all of a sudden the guy who's willing to listen to the, the old wise and sage, you know, and do, do whatever stupid thing he tells you, end up being the hero of the movie. Wax on, wax off. Some of you that are older will get that. <laughs> you know? And so when you listen to the grand ma listen, the grand master is Jesus. He's the one we follow. He's the one we listen to. Even Paul went on to say, but it doesn't stop there. He said, listen, follow with me. Be followers together of me and mark them which walk in a different way. So you have us for an example. In other words, he's saying, if they don't follow this format, then they're not for us. And the format, you want to know what the format is? Look at me. Why? And he went on later, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. He said, you can do what I'm doing because I'm doing what Jesus is doing. But you know, I'll tell you in a nutshell, the number one problem in our nation and even in the world, but more so I believe in our nation than anything else is this issue of leadership. Everybody wants to be a leader, but nobody wants to follow. And we are not qualified as leaders till we learn how to follow. Some of you have been in the military if I learned that. That's a hard way, you? <laughs> but isn't it true? If we want to be a leader, then we better learn how to follow. We better learn how to listen. We better learn how to take instruction. We better learn the importance of, of instruction and receiving the word. And here we have him saying, follow me. How many men can get up today and tell their wife, follow me because I'm following Jesus? How many mamas can stand up to the children? How many parents can stand before the kids and say, you keep following me because I'm following Jesus? Anybody not doing what I'm doing? They're messed up. You follow me. Follow me. I'm following the Lord. The greatest failure we're facing is this crisis of leadership. And it starts from the White House to the Congress to the state to the city to the country on down the line. We've lost the call to be men of God. Where are the men of God? David the psalmist in Psalm what, 78 to 80, right? And he says, Lord, help us for the godly man ceases from amongst the face of the earth. Where's a godly man? Where's a, where's a person who's going to really stand up for God? Not that just going to be religious. Not somebody who's going to have some kind of moral code of ethics, but somebody who's going to follow Jesus. And when they follow Christ, people are following them. Leadership. By the way, Gideon said, I'm, I'm the leader, pay attention, because I'm following somebody else's leadership. I've gotten the instruction. It's the same with Joshua when he's standing at Jericho. And remember, he has, all of a sudden, there's somebody standing there beside him with a sword in their hand. And Joshua said, are you for us or for the army of the Lord? Or are you for the, the enemies? He said, I'm, basically, he said, I just came to take over. That was the comment, basically. I didn't come to take sides. I came to take over because it was the Lord of glory. And Joshua humbles himself to the leadership of the commander-in-chief. And because he's humble before God, God uses him and anoints him and blesses him with what he needs to have. We can have authority on our life as long as we submit to God's authority in our life. But there's a lot of people who say, well, I'm an authority here. You pay attention to me. I didn't get anybody's attention. You want to find out if you're a leader? I think Rick Warren said, if you want to know if you're a leader, just look over your shoulders. Anybody follow him? That's a pretty good definition, isn't it? Nobody's following, you're not a leader. You think you are. But if wife's not following, others aren't following, children aren't following, maybe we're not much the leaders we thought we perhaps thought we were. Now, he just says, I'm the leader. I'm, so follow, do what I do. Listen, it's my goal, and whether you're a deacon, an elder, a lift leader, anybody in leadership in this church. Our goal is, first of all, we, we, we're following Christ. We want to follow Christ because as we follow Christ, God gives us authority so that we can say, this is the direction we're supposed to go. But you know, we're living in a day and age when a pastor gets before a congregation and says, do what I'm doing. Follow me. We're going to, go, we're going to do this for the glory of God. And some say, oh, maybe. Might. Might. What are you going to do? What's it going to cost me? Where are we going to go? I don't like that idea. That stinks. I think we ought to do it this way. 
But when you get in the fire and in the furnace and the presence of God, we'll listen to you. Amen? We don't want to be that clanging symbol that the scripture talks about. We, we, we need people who say, I'm, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And so first of all, what's the first instruction? Look at me. Second instruction. And when you look, do what I do. Don't just hear what I do. Just don't look. Don't just see it. Now do it. You need whatever I do. And then he says, when I blow the trumpets, you blow the trumpets. When I, you sound the alarm, you know, I, that's when it's done. You do what you're supposed to do. You blow the trumpets, match pictures. And it says they did that. What, what, now catch the actions that, that follow here. This is really important when he says, do what I do. You get into these, first of all, he says, when I blow the trumpet, and they blew the trumpet. Now, these trumpets, again, are going to make a big, horrible noise. And by the way, the trumpets, there's usually one trumpeter per division of about 10,000 men. So imagine what 300,000 soldiers would have would be the sound of about 300 trumpets. Now, 300,000 men standing on the mountain around you in the middle of the dark is startling because you're only 132,000. You're outnumbered three to one. Please understand, that's always the odds in Jesus. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The devil. <laughs> All right? Now, the Midianites do represent the devil. They don't represent the lost world. See, some of you think that the lost world's your enemy. People that cry, they're not your enemy. That's who we're here for. All right? That, that's what we're all about. And if you, hadn't, if you hadn't worked that into the equation yet, your math's bad. Amen? It's, all, it's people. We love people. Jesus loves people. We're here for people. We're here against the enemy that holds people in captivity. It says, so blow the trumpet. Let it be heard. Joel 2, 1 says, blow you the trumpet in Zion and sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord comes and nigh is at hand. Well, that's, a, that's a great verse, isn't it? But you know, that's the same for us today. We should be blowing the trumpet. There should be something distinctive about our life is what I'm trying to say. That causes people to look at us and see that we are different. I think we've, we've somehow certainly been, I'm trying to think of a nice word, neutered. That's the best one i come up with. <laughs> we've been neutered, been neutralized by thinking that somehow, you know, that there's this lost world out there and we're going to reach them, but we can't show that we're different from them. And when that's what happens, then you lose the trumpet. There's no sound. It's the distinctiveness of our lives. It's the uniqueness of who we are now in Christ, that we really are new creations in Christ Jesus. And it is that nuance, it is that newness, it is that difference that God has made in us that sets us apart. That's what the word holy means. We're set apart, we're holy. And people look at us and say, you know, there's something different about that guy. There's something different about that woman. What is it? I'm in love with Jesus. My life has changed. I've tasted of the grace of God. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not bound anymore. I, I am free. Blow the trumpet. And how do we do that? We have a very distinctive commitment to the Lord Jesus in our heart and our life. 1 Corinthians 14, 8 says, If the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for the battle? You know what that's talking about? It's talking about your testimony, your walk, your witness to the lost world. You don't reach them by being just like them. You reach them by being unique. And there's something about that uniqueness that is certain. There's something about it that it's clear. That if we'll walk in that, he says, all right, you blow the trumpets and then you smash the pitcher. Break the clay vessel that the light is, 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 is encased in. We will never really experience the glory of God in our life as long as this vessel is not broken. If we maintain our self-will, if we maintain our hard-heartedness, if we choose to be stubborn and not let God be God, then we miss the beauty of God's grace upon our life. Why? Because we have this treasure in earthen vessels, but it will not get out and it will not shine out. It will not be spoken out if we're still obstinate or fearful or unbelieving or, or living in our own rebellion. We just miss the clarity of this moment. The Bible says we are to shine as lights in this dark world. And by the way, the world is darker than it's ever been. And when it's dark, it's even the smallest light that stands out. It's even the tiniest light that stands out. Philippians 2.14, Paul's writing to the church, says, listen, quit your griping. <laughs> Do everything without murmuring and disputing. 
that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and a perverse nation, among whom you will shine as lights in the world. What does it mean to be broken? I think simply put, it just means that I have thrown my will down and said, not my will, but thy will be done. I've thrown my way to the side. Let it go to ruin so that I can find a greater will and a greater call and a greater meaning to my life. To be broken means to embrace the will of God over my will. Put your clay vessel up, let it be shattered. And by the way, how did they shatter that? I just thought it was interesting. Shatter, well, it says they had the trumpet in the right hand and the clay vessel with the light in it. And I don't know how big these pots were, but they're big enough to hold some good light, all right? Is it burn in it? The only way to break that is to take that trumpet and smash that jar. The only way I think that we get broken is by what that trumpet represents. Ultimately, it's that call of God to uniqueness. It's that call of God to rise up. It's that call of God to be his child. It's that call of God to be his man, to be that woman of God, to be that young person who will just dare to be what God's called you to be. That you take that call and you let it shatter your will. You let it take over your life. You let it basically destroy anything that would hinder your walk with God. Broken vessels reveal the light. In Matthew 5, it says this passage, he said, you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Listen, how do we hide it? We have to, we rise to the occasion. We're like the city that's set on, you can't hide it. He said, you don't take your light and you put it under a bushel. Well, I've talked about that before. That bushel represents the material world, represents popularity, represents materialism. It represents prosperity in the context of the way, what the world calls prosperity. And unfortunately, that's the message that the, that the church many times gives. We've got all these, you know, prophets, P-R-O-F-I-T-S. There's a difference between P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S, all right, who tell you that, you know, that what you need is God's blessing, God's, God's abundance, and God wants to make you rich, and God you never, doesn't want you to ever be sick, and God wants you to have this. And it's all about you and what you can get and what you can gain and how to get it and how to, how to learn how to ring God's little heavenly bell so he comes like a, a little servant to meet your need. That's not the message of the Scripture. The message of the Scripture is I am the servant unto God. The message of the Scripture is that God wants to use me for his glory. And if I take this light and make my life about me, that's a bushel. He said, men do not light a candle and put it under a bushel. He said, neither do men light a candle and put it under their bed. Good way to burn your bed up, by the way. And ruin your bushel, too. You don't put it on your bed. What's that represent? It's spiritual laziness. What hinders so many people, especially in our, in our culture today? I think those are the two things. You know, I, I need more money and I need more rest. I need more stuff. I need more time to play with it. <laughs> that pretty much boils it down, doesn't it? Give me more stuff. Give me more time to play with it. So where's time for God? Where's time for God's will? Where's time for what God wants? Where's time, where, where, where's God fit in this scenario? He doesn't because we've taken our lamp and we've taken our light and it's under our bed and it's under our bushel instead of shining like light set on a city, on a hill to be seen by all men around us. He said... Let your light so shine before men. These are the words of Jesus in red letters. Let your light so shine before men that they may see. In other words, it's, you've got to shine it enough for people to see. That they may see your good works. And that's talking about the will of God being done in your life. And as they see that, they'll glorify God. They will glorify your Father in heaven. I wasn't left here for me. I wasn't left here to gain I wasn't left here to get more. I was left here for the glory of God. You're here. If you can get this down, it'll transform your life. You're here not for you. You're here for the glory of God. And the glory of God is to make a difference in the world that you live in. Take that trumpet. Shatter that vessel. Let God's voice here be heard in your ears and let it shatter anything that's in his way. And what happens? Light begins to pour out. Light begins to explode forth. And you see the glory of God being revealed in your life. Broken vessels and trumpets in their hands. That's all they had. They didn't have any swords in their hand. Broken lights and trumpets. Verse 20 says, And they blew the trumpets that were in their right hands, and the torches that were in their left hand, they broke. So he says, Do what I do. 
what I'm going to do. I'm going to sound the trumpet. I'm going to smash the pitcher. And so the third thing I do is I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to shout. Okay, what do I shout? Shout the sword of the Lord. I say, shout the word of God. Shout the sword of the Lord. Shout the sword of the Lord. That's what you'll shout. Excuse me. What am I supposed to shout? He says, hey, when the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers, held the torch in their left hand, the trumpets in the right hand for blowing, and they cried for the sword, a sword for the Lord, and a sword for Gideon. And remember, they didn't use a sword. They weren't even given a sword. They just cried the sword. But again, when you realize the awesome power of the Word of God, you'll start realizing it. What are you doing temptation? Pull my sword. That word, if I hit in my heart, then I'm not sin against God. What do you do if I want to be a godly man or be a godly husband? The Bible says, love your wife. So I pull that sword and I choose to love my wife. What are you going to do when you, when you encounter a lost world? Stand, be holy. That's pulling out the word of God. That's pulling your sword. That's speaking the gospel. I'll share the truth of God's word. That is the sword which penetrates the heart. That's the sword which makes a difference. That's the sword which changes life. That's the sword which does something supernaturally powerful. In the book of, uh, of Matthew, well, several of the Gospels, Jesus is, is in Capernaum, and he stands up to teach him on the synagogues, and he quotes these words, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because he, the Lord, hath anointed me to preach the good tidings unto the meek. And he hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. And he hath sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and to the opening up of the prisons to them that are bound. Now, honestly, if Christ lives in you, I mean, if you really are, if you're not a pretend believer, if you're a genuine saint of God, this scripture is something that applies to your life because Christ is in you. So therefore, because we know the great commandment of the Lord, you say, what's the great commandment? Love God and love others. Followed by a great commission. Tell everybody. That's the commission. So we take this sword. We love God. We love everybody, and we tell everybody. What am I telling? The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach his word, his good tidings unto the meek. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to those that are in captivity. It's the same, it's the same message we have. It's, it's applicable to my life. It's applicable to your life that you are here and you are now to stand up and speak the word of God to the captive, to the brokenhearted, to the bound. I'd applaud if I were me. I am me. <laughs> Let me read you a quote from Matthew Henry. Probably more commentaries of Matthew Henry and people's personal libraries than about any other commentary that is out there. Hundreds of years ago, he, he made this reference to this passage. He said, this method here of taking, the taking of defeating the Midianites may be alluded to as one. It's typifying the destruction of the devil's kingdom in the world. How do we do it? By preaching of the everlasting gospel, the sounding of that trumpet, and holding forth the light out of the earthen vessels for such the ministers of the gospel are, and whom the treasures of that light are deposited. In 2 Corinthians 4, thus God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, like a barley cake coming down to overthrow the tents of Midian. We want to say that the excellency of the power might be of God only. The gospel is a sword, not in the hand, but in the mouth, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, of God and of Jesus Christ, him that sits on the throne and the throne of the Lamb. What we have, in the gospel message, in those words that are in our hearts, that need yet to be in our mouth to people around us, in those words, the apostle says, it is the gospel, the power of God unto salvation. That when we speak those words, when we pull up ourselves out of our little pitiful situations and our arrogance and our pride and our unbroken vessels and have the courage to stand up and speak the word and say, thus saith the Lord, God does things. He does supernatural things. But if we're going to sit back and be like that 22,000 Gideon, but hey, if you're afraid, go home. How often I've just wanted to stand before the church and say, some of y'all need to go home. Some of you need to hit the trail because you're never going to do anything for God and you're never going to be anything for God as long as your vessel's unbroken. As long as you let fear and popularity and opinion of people determine your walk and your situation in life, you're not going to be used of God. 
high time that we hear a clear trumpet sound from pulpits across this nation. Says, Get up off your blessed assurance. Open your mouth for the glory of God and speak the word of truth to everybody around you. Uh, you know, I'm just thinking, you know, I almost see somebody saying, well, Brother Joe, I would do that, but it's just not a very opportune situation. Maybe if the Lord would open the door. Can't you see those 300 gathered around the camp of Midian, outnumbered? And one guy saying, you know, I'm not about to break my trumpet up here and draw attention to myself. I don't think the Lord wants us drawing attention to ourselves. Well, that's a nice clay pot. <laughs> you know how much I paid for this clay pot? You know what this cost me? And do you know what they might say about us? Look how stupid this is, 300 against 132,000. How ignorant is this? How stupid can I be? Just watch me and do what I do. That was the, isn't that great? And we know clearly what the Lord does. Not just then, but as now, we see this supernatural. Stand in your place. Be what God's called you to be. Don't back up. Don't give up. Don't shut up. Don't let up. Just stand in your place. Break your picture. Get your heart right. Surrender your life without reservation to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and let your light shine. Let the world know about Jesus. Let them know about the word. Let them know about the cross. And God gave this great victory. I mean, there was this supernatural victory. It said when the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers, they held the torches in their left hand, trumpets in the right hand for the blowing and cried a sword for the Lord and Gideon. Each stood in his place. They didn't go running off or running down. They stood in their place. And all the army below ran, crying like a bunch of babies which the enemy always does. Oh, Jesus, what am I to do with thee, the Son of God? You know, I'm always amazed at Satan's reaction to the presence of God. <laughs> Don't hurt me. Don't send me to that desolate place. Throw me to pigs instead. I mean, isn't that the reaction of demons to the presence of God? 1 Corinthians 1, 18, for the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing, but to us it is the power of God to those of us that are saved. I know where the power is. You know where the power is. It's in the message of the cross, but it has to be spoken. 1 Corinthians 1, 21, three verses later. For after the, that in the wisdom of God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that are lost. And preaching there doesn't mean preacher, pastor, evangelist. It means all of us. He's writing the church. Speak the word. It says what it means. Preach is the word which means to speak out. Let it be heard. You want to be popular at school? I got the first sure fire way to do it. Just start telling everybody at school about Jesus. It might not be the kind of popularity you wanted. It'll change a lot of lives. Be popular in the workplace? Well, they'll call me preacher, man. I think that's an honor, excuse me. <laughs> might be a dishonor to you to be called a preacher, man. Be blessed if you're called that. Now, catch this. It's in the still, deep of the night, beginning of the second watch. Everybody's asleep. Somebody just had to get up and go do the second watch. I don't want to. I'm tired, but it's my turn. So I'm going to go be on watch. And just in the middle watch, just beginning, the sentinels are getting in their place. Here's what happens. Terror seizes the Midianites. Terror seizes their hearts. And not only was it just terror, it was a God-sent terror. God sent terror to the hearts. It says when they did this, it says while the 300 blew the trumpets, the Midianites thought they were under attack and began to destroy one another. Now, it repeats that story twice in, in those passages. It says it twice, and it's intentionally repeated to show that they, they didn't need a sword. They just needed the Lord. They just needed to do what God told them to do. He said, and Jehovah, God, Jehovah's the word there. Jehovah set every man's sword against his fellow, against the whole camp. We used to say it like this, you know, yeah, hey, one for all and all for one. In this case, it was all against one, one against all. Everybody's your enemy. It's the dark of the night. Nobody knows what's going on. Everybody's running around, flew and bumping into each other. They start stabbing and killing. Why? God sent this terror. Now, this is a great battle. It's not the first time if you study the nation of Israel in their history that they did this. I mean, they've even done in current recent history they did this. 
about four declarations signed back late 30s, early 40s, when Israel was finally established as a nation. You know, and when that happened, the, the Brits who kind of provided some source of security for that little band of Jews that moved back to Israel, they moved back to a little parcel of land that they okay, this is this is this is Israel now. You have a nation, and so they pour in there. You know, and they got the. It's really just swamp land. It's got to be drained. It's got you know dysentery and typhus and all kinds of malaria, mosquitoes. I mean, it's a nasty place. And they go in there and they begin to drain those swamps and pull out a living and build homes and build, you know, a place for themselves. And the, the Arab nations surrounding them are really ticked off about the whole deal. Their mind says, we're going to cut every throat and drive them into the ocean, every last one of them. But it wasn't until they were really able to do it until the Brits pulled out. And so the Brits and their brilliance, like so many times as Americans do, we pull out, the Brits do, and they leave their tanks, their weaponry, all the big stuff. It's just easier to leave it. But who gets it? The Jews? No. The Arabs. And so the Arabs are celebrating that the finally the last Brit has stepped off the shore onto the ship and has set sails back for Great Britain. And as they're heading out, the Arabs are already plotting the destruction of the nation of Israel. In the middle of the night, Simon apparently hears from God in the camp of Israel. All right? What do they do? They ain't got any tanks. They don't have any planes. They don't have any machine guns. Most of them have little single-shot rifles if they have anything, or a pistol at best. We call all the people together, men and women. What few vehicles we have, pull the mufflers off of them. Grab every empty 55-gallon barrel you can find with every length of chain you can find. By the, Israel, by the Arabs are camped in their encampments surrounding the nation of Israel that evening. They began to bring those cool cars and trucks sounding like tanks with the mufflers off. If you've ever knocked a muffler off your car, you know what I'm talking about. It's loud. And they take those barrels and they roll them across with those chains on trying to make them sound like tanks coming across that floor the land they're going in and in the middle of the night when that noise started stirring and that rumbling of engines started firing up and those chains started clanking against those 55 gallon drums the Arabs ran into the dark of the night as terror sees them I believe Jehovah calls that terror deeper in their hearts and fortunately they left an army of equipment there for the Jews and overnight Israel owned all that equipment and since stood one miracle after another. I say that to say this. You think God loves you any less? No. God's no respecter of persons. Do you not think God will act on your behalf in your situation if you'll take courage? Do you think God won't stand with you and stand behind you and in front of you and beside you and over you in your situation when you just say, hey, I don't know what people are going to think say about me and what I do. I'm, I'm going to start living for Christ. I'm just, going to be, I'm just going to be a man of God. I'm going to be that woman of God. I'm going to be a young person who loves Jesus and unashamed of it. Do you think God's not going to take care of you? Do you think he's going to abandon you? He will never leave you nor forsake you. Those words of promise were nestled into the words which says, Go, make disciples of all nations. Then I'll never leave you. Don't be afraid to stand for what you believe in. Don't be afraid to be what God's called you to be. You know where you are as the church? And I'm just talking about believers. I'm talking about all churches in America, across this, across this nation. And I, I speak because I'm desperately concerned about our nation. We're in a heap of trouble. You know, there's not been too many nations that have reversed the course once they got this far down the wrong track. And we are far down the wrong road. And all you have to do is read history, read Gibbon's thesis on the destruction of Rome. You see we're following the same pattern of immorality, of corruption, of greed, of selfishness. And the only thing that's going to make the difference is when the light shines, when the city is clearly shining, when the bushels and the beds are pulled off the lights, when the vessels are broken, then the light can shine. And as the light shines from our life, then God makes a difference in our nation. I think it comes back to the submission to the lordship of Jesus, submission to the leadership, sounding of the trumpets, shattering our vessels, shining our lights, shouting out loud, letting people know who we are. I'll just put it this way.
I'm going to keep on shouting. And I'm committed to shout louder than I ever shouted before. So you've been shouting a lot this morning. Just hold on. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm not going anywhere. So, Brother John, you know, if you would just temper it down a little bit, we'd have some more church members. We, we'd probably have some more church members. Is that what it's about, more church members? Or is it about making a difference in the world? Seeing people's life change. But the tragedy is if we would shout but not shine. We have to shine. The shining takes place outside the doors. We can all shout here together in the church. We can all have big cheerleading sessions Sunday after Sunday, sing all the great songs and rejoice together and praise the Lord. But what happens when our feet hit the sidewalk once we're leaving this facility? I'm going to keep preaching and I'm going to keep shining. I'm going to keep preaching the truth. I'm not going to back down from it. I'm not going to bow down to the system. I'm not going to bow down to what's popular in theology or popular in church growth or the culture. And I don't think you want to either. But at the same time, we can't be content to, I call it, I call it conservative apostasy. You say, what do you, what do you mean by that? I mean, we have a people who are conservatively and truly committed to the word of God, but they're apostate in their calling to go take that word out of the, out of the building. You know? I've been in lots of churches when evangelism said, enter to serve on one side of the auditorium door, and there was an exit to the mission field. I mean, enter to, enter to worship, exit to the mission field. That has to be the mindset. That has to be the mentality. And, and I really believe somewhere in the process of, of problems and crisis and difficulties and issues and, you know, personal things and economics and all the stuff the world hits us with, we've let too much of that impact our shouting, our voice. We've got to come back and say, Lord, forgive me for having a, a voice that's, that's not sounding, that's not saying, sword of the Lord, the word of God, the word of God, the word of God. Get my heart right. Let my vessel be broken so that I shine as well as I shout. And I shout as well as I shine. See what God does. See what God does. That's the message. That's the message that has to be resounding in our part. And I think Gideon is a perfect illustration for that, each one of us. Because it really shows us how human, left on our own measures, and weak we can be. Left our own devices. Gideon starts the story out. He's trying to make it out of living. He got living for his family. You know, doing a little farming, hiding out, trying to do it. Keep, it, keep the devil from stealing everything. You know, the devil's going to get me. And God comes to him and says, you know, there's, there's something better. <clears throat> One is, we can drive this enemy out of your life so you don't have to live like this. We can drive the enemy out so you don't have to live like a spiritual pauper. We can make some decisions. But we have to stand. We have to be broken. We have to let our light shine. The Lord says to his church today, look at me and do what I do. Pretty simple instruction, isn't it? But it's life transforming. Would you stand with your heads bowed?